So I, I'm sitting here with Liz Rosenthal, who uh, I've known for many years and has an extensive experienced background in independent feature film uh, production, financing, distribution, and then most recently in the transmedia or cross-media world with Power of the Pixel. And rather than try to describe Power of the Pixel myself, I'd love to hear from, your, from you um, how it started and what it's become. Well, the company started in 2007, um, but I've been working in the independent film world from back in the 90s. I worked with an American company called Next Wave Films, and we were very involved in helping emerging filmmakers make their first features and selling them into the marketplace. I saw Chris Nolan was one of your early... Yeah, we were very, him. very lucky. Um, he was our sort of poster child in a way, and it was our second film that we got involved in. So we were a finishing fund, and we, we were involved in helping finish following his first feature film. So Next Wave made 14 feature films, and um, most of them won major prizes at film festivals like Sundance um, or Rotterdam, um, and um, they had great critical acclaim. But when it came to distribution, they hardly reached their audience, even though at that moment we felt they had very, very strong core audiences, the movies that we got involved in. And that was something we felt was due to the way that films were distributed. And at the same time, and this is at the beginning of sort of, it was 2000, 2001, 2002, when the company closed, things started really changing because of um, the internet. People started engaging with media in totally different ways. Uh, businesses started using the internet um, to have a more direct relationship with consumers. And I thought that this was something that would be really interesting to look at in terms of story and film. And so I became very interested in new business models and the kind of distribution end and the audience engagement end. And finally, as things started to develop online, you start realizing how it's not just about distribution. Once the tools and the platforms change, it's about the way that you tell stories changes. So it made me very interested in looking at new ways you could develop story forms that could develop into feature films, but ideas basically that start somewhere and then extend in different ways in different places. Mm -hmm. So if someone experiences an idea online or they experience it in real life or they experience it in a book or on a tablet, it's going to be very different. But there's a kind of relationship between that idea or a story world, you could say, in terms of um, fictional and both mm -hmm. documentary projects is this idea of a world that you um, engage with in a different way wherever you are. And it's a kind of very exciting area to be in because it means I'm in contact with people now across many different industries who are realising that they can no longer be siloed within their industry. Um, they have to sort of connect up um, and these things kind of fit together. So we um, empowered the pixel we basically have a great network of people who are connected into the cross-media or transmedia world, both in the film, the television, um, the advertising, the games and interactive and the publishing space. Mm. So um, we come from the film business originally, but it was funny that looking at how the independent film world kind of like was struggling, well it's always struggled in a way, um, was a really interesting, you know, with the growth of networked world, it was it's really exciting time to start looking about how that could change for storytellers and businesses. And and how many years has Power of the Pixel been running as a, as a forum, annual event? We started, so we started um, our forum um, in 2007 and that's when the company started and the Cross Media Forum is our centrepiece event that we run every October in association with the BFI London Film Festival. So um, that's where we bring together um, projects that we maybe have helped develop or we've been involved in in some way or that we've discovered over the year. And we invite sort of makers and thinkers um, and businesses to talk about what they've done over that year and to see to sort of show where we are because things are moving so fast and the forum also has the first dedicated cross-media marketplace in the world so we select around 25 to 30 projects um, and these are totally we're totally agnostic to what this means they're new story formats mm -hmm. so some have a feature film as part of the property some um, don't some have sort of television uh, some uh, kind of native, totally native cross-media projects. So 
Um, they may start with a graphic novel and have ideas of growing in many different ways. And that's a two-day market. We also have a project competition and we always run a think tank on the last day. So last year we concentrated on financing cross-media projects. So we invited 45 people from around the world to brainstorm ideas around some real projects that are oh, on the table. It's really interesting to use the practical examples as a, uh, for discussion. We always use, and we always use practical examples because it's such a. Um, I think the word, these words like transmedia and cross media, they really confuse people, and I think there's a really easy way sometimes of bringing it down to earth is to talk about stories and audiences, and those essentially we're trying to create story forms and we're trying to reach audiences and obviously monetize um, what we're making. Mm. So I think those are really just for. I think people get alienated from the world transmedia and I think there's, this is going to happen more and more this year actually. I'm starting to see a backlash and I can understand that. It's always like when there's a new buzzword and um, people go, well, what's happened? What's the business model? What success have we seen? And it's very hard to sort of capture that. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to sort of present an array of different case studies. Um, and as we do that and more and more things produced and are launched, we start to find some kind of patterns that we could mm -hmm we can say, well, this is a really interesting example of moving forward that maybe you can apply to many different projects. There's no sort of template in any way whatsoever, but there are sort of practical things and um, methods, I think, that work across many things. I think that's really, I mean, I've been going to the event for four years, I think it is now, and it's something I look forward to. I mean, I'm not just flattering you for flattery's sake. I mean, it, it really is one of the best events of its kind that I've been to. and. It, that's a, primarily because of the, the, the mix of people that come, but also that sort of practical hands-on approach that you're talking about real projects, you're strategizing about how to take those things forward and to find the finance and, and whatnot for them. And I think it's a really interesting mix of ideas, people, and, and hands-on practical stuff. But I've also you know, noticed that, that as, as this transmedia buzzword has kind of created controversy, at the same time, there's a professionalism setting in at the Power of the Pixel event in terms of what people are pitching. Because I think a few years ago, things were very avant-garde, experimental, and kind of niche, you know, and sometimes downright peculiar. And you're thinking, okay, well, I'm not sure how that's going to fly, but who am I to say? And then now they seem to be, they have much more strategic planning. There, you know, there's there's money involved, and they, and and perhaps also, you know, I remember the opening of the last year's event. Thomas Hogue talked about this idea that like, why don't you anchor? your transmedia project in something from traditional media. Because most stories could be exploited as a television series or a film. And at least if you put it, if, if you have that anchor tenant of some kind, then you can get money from that industry because I understand what you're working towards. But you can put your transmedia project in that, in that environment with them. And I think that th I saw that more and more in some of the projects that are being presented just you know, by happenstance, I suppose, that they were thinking of how could this story work as a television series or a motion picture at some point in time when it was appropriate because those are expensive endeavors and so they were looking at other ways to get there. And then you have things like Lance Wheeler's projects which are really out there <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and are conceptually totally different. So it, it's, a, it's an interesting mix and I think it's really exciting that you do that. But I'd love to use this as a segue into this, this, the, the nomenclature of transmedia, crossmedia because this is a contro controversial um, you know, buzzword right now, what's the difference? What does it mean to you? Uh, how do you, when you employ those words, what are you thinking of? What are you, the distinguishing characteristics of it? You know, I always say I'm never going to get involved in a definition um, <laughs> conversation um, because I kind of think um, it's not so important. And the reason I think it's not so important is exactly what I was saying before, is I think we're trying to help advise people and create projects that um, make sense in terms of how they how they are created to address the audiences who would be interested in and in them and we'd like to sort of think we don't want to be bound up by definition I guess you know if you're going to go into the two camps of cross media and transmedia um, transmedia um, advocates um, believe that cross media is about reformatting so it's taking an idea and just just reformatting it for another platform whereas transmedia is a kind of clever uh, development of story across platform which i was describing before it's like mm -hmm. how does an audience experience an idea mm -hmm. in a different way in a different place and it's not just this idea of reformatting one one part of the story it's about discovering another part of that world 
on another platform in another service in, in real life or wherever it happens to be. But to a certain extent, I like to stay agnostic to what this is because I feel that it makes what we do more inclusive and more open for people because I think that um, we know that you know the media industries are very siloed still and um, the money is still around developing traditional product and there's very little money to develop these kind of projects and people and if the money's not there they're going to carry on developing the things where there is money to develop and it's only the kind of a lot of the crazy pioneers and experimenters mm. who like to go into these areas who maybe are not so concerned about risk or um, they can risk so I can understand why people sort of uh, you know feel you know they can't sort of dip into this area yet so we like to be as inclusive as possible and in a way I chose the definition I chose cross media because I felt it was more inclusive and we want to address all of these things so we want people like distributors and exhibitors to come to the things we do as well um, and if I think you say you know you're you're all about transmedia um, then I think it kind of makes people feel well, that's not for me yet mm. Whereas if you're kind of... Yeah, you say, get, well, there are people that are very purists and say transmedia can only be one type of activity and then you, you, know, you alienate everybody else. That makes sense. And it, within the transmedia community, there are many different arguments happening online about what transmedia is and, oh, that's not transmedia, it shouldn't be part of this. And we're interested in new story forms, really, and new ways of audiences are engaging with stories. And I chose the word cross media because I thought it kind of described it in the best way. But even then, we mm. I find people sort of say, "Oh, you're no longer talking about distribution now," you know, because we started the forum with a tagline that had distribution, mm. and in fact, we're kind of talking about the whole property, mm. like from it, the whole life cycle of a project. So it includes kind of everything. Well, I think as you described when you were talking about your history, your background in Next Wave, that it began with the, uh, the desire to find a way to improve distribution for certain products and then it blossomed into oh can we tell stories in a new way so I think those are the bottom line at the end of the day you're looking at new forms of storytelling and new forms of distribution for those stories and that and the terminology hasn't settled down yet I suppose you know personally uh, you know I like the word transmedia for a, a host of reasons but it strikes me as probably one of the best words there is in the moment to describe these activities I don't see anything particularly better and you know, I don't know what the political uh, reason for the Producers Guild of America, you know, giving uh, status or credibility to this credit of transmedia producer, but to me, it should, I think it's something the community should embrace because it's saying that, you know, the, that the sort of powers that be, the traditional institutions are acknowledging that something new is happening and that the people that work in, in, in make a career out of those activities have to have a, a different skill set and we want to sort of acknowledge that. And I think that's a good thing. Because, I, I, you know, what's always attracted me to transmedia or cross-media activities is that it tends to bring technical and creative people together who don't normally get the chance to work together. So you might have, you know, UI designers with coders, with writers, and they're all in the same, under the same roof. And I think that's an exciting happening. And I think transmedia producer and this sort of thing is acknowledging that there are people that have to know how to manage these personalities and marshal forth their creative output into something different and I think we should get behind that <laughs> rather than tear it apart but it, at least the old you know all good all debate is good debate so absolutely and I totally agree in a way transmedia um, is a word that works kind of the best and when you look at what it is mm. um, absolutely but I think because it was an academic term that's why it's going to suffer from um, people sort of trying to define what is and what isn't. Mm. But as you mentioned, of course, it's really important that sort of um, recognized industry guilds and structures have recognized that it's an important category that we have to bring into business. And uh, totally say it's a great thing the Producers Guild you know, adopted this credit. And, but then there are, many, there are many people who are critics of, of mm. the definition of the transmedia producer for exactly that reason and for other mm. business reasons. But it's always really difficult when you're trying to define you know, a new kind of like business or a new strategy, once you get bound up, you have to define it in a way because we're trying to find people to invest in what we do. And from a practical point of view, you have to sort of put where the parameters are. And that's always going to piss people off mm. because it's going to exclude some people. But I think as you, as you point out, for investors' sake, they need to know what they're investing in. So mm. it helps to have some kind of consistent definition of it. And we can work towards that. But I, I guess what I 
was curious to ask you, which you've already answered some of these questions in a way, but I'm wondering, is, is transmedia storytelling a, a process or a methodology, or an approach, a product, or is it a mindset, or is it all those things? Um, I would say it's kind of all of those things, and that's why it makes it such an amorphous mm. word, really. But yes, absolutely, it's all of those things. Um, but I like when we started talking earlier. We were talking about you know, about being entrepreneurial, and in a way, you could say taking a transmedia approach is being entrepreneurial in a kind of creative and a business way about how you tell your story, and realizing that there is a huge potential for that idea there's a world around that story that you could develop in any way mm. that could develop out in many different ways mm -hmm. um, and not to be limited by distribution a distribution format in a way and that's what I think is happening people are very limited by the format they're used to working in and if you're going to be a producer who wants to sort of um, take an entrepreneurial approach to what you're creating you're gonna have to think in a transmedia mm -hmm. or cross-media type way well, there's something else that I think is really important in what you're saying, from my p point of view, which is that um, if, you, if you are an independent producer or artist who has an idea that could grow to be something big, and you want to have equity in that idea, then you generally cannot approach this, the traditional resources um, to get that idea off the ground. Because they are not like VCs in a, in a technology startup uh, construct, they act as distributors or publishers or whatever, and so they need to take rights ownership and do other things, which kind of cuts you out of the future. And I think, therefore, if you're somebody that has, who wants to invest in intellectual property and have an equity stake in that intellectual property, you need to build that property somehow to a point that when you negotiate with those other people, um, they can be partners instead of uh, owners. And so I think transmedia, to me, is a really important idea for the independent as a means of investing and building IP that may or may not be a franchise, but at least it is something they can have a stake in in the future. And so if anything, if transmedia comes to mean that type of activity and investors understand, oh, this is an IP building exercise that's outside of the traditional structure, then that's good enough for me because at least they'll understand what it is that people are trying to do with it. And so, in a way, while I personally love to see um, really fascinating new business models conceived in the transmedia world, my primary interest is to get the word out to investors and distributors and whomever that transmedia is an activity where we're building IP and we're going to make it big or make it deep. And I want to retain uh, an equity ownership stake in that, as will the primary uh, creatives who work on it. And we want to treat it like an, an entrepreneurial business, as you would in, in Silicon Valley, let's say, on a similar terms. Absolutely. And it also is, a, is going to bring the investment community into content creation, which has been really rare up to now. It's so hard to, um, for independent work. And I think it's been in kind of startup, independent startup work. Uh, we never, we rarely see um, investors coming into that area. And it's kind of an exciting challenge for us. Um, there are a few investors who are starting to step into that area. Are these sort of like angel investors or corporate institutions? Corporate okay. institutions um, that in North America we're starting to see this happen. Mm. Um, and hopefully um, we'll start seeing some more movement in this. And I think it's totally right. If you start thinking of it as an idea as IP that you have an equity stake in, it's a completely different ball game. But that brings, there's a challenge as well at the same time because we're sitting in this in-between period where you mentioned how Thomas Herg said, you know, the mm. best way to approach um, cross-media development is to attach, is to bolt on to traditional media. So we're in a conflict zone at the moment mm. because no way that money can work or that mindset works still with the traditional structures because they are working exactly the same way they ever did and the way that money's invested through um, traditional commissions or soft funding is, it, is very, very rigid still mm. and doesn't allow for this. So. It's, do you start something that is truly native, a native cross-media, transmedia idea mm -hmm. that kind of starts in that completely free for free space that could grow as a way a startup, a tech startup mm -hmm. could grow? Or do you go for the traditional kind of secure format and hope you may be able to develop some things around that format? You know, it's funny. I see this, I see this confusion happen often. Well, often. I see it happen in places like YouTube when... 
you know, some particular individual becomes a sensation. And then the traditional uh, distributors or whatever say, okay, let's make a it's like a TV movie or something with this personality, and it, it doesn't do so well, or <laughs> because it's not, it's not the right approach, let's say, and so that's perhaps a bolt-on um, that comes after the fact, and so it'd be interesting to say if you were that individual and you're going to form a business around some kind of IP, this might not necessarily be the route that you would take. It may not be appropriate to, to the growth. It may be an opportunity to do something, that is a television or film exploitation down the line, but at this juncture, it's not the right way forward. It's, an, it's a really interesting point and in a way, um, so someone like Jeff Gomez who's doing, who's a, one of the sort of leading experts in sort of understanding worlds and story worlds around many different concepts, kind of taking his approach, whether it's a, for a, a, an idea that started online, it may be one person or a larger project, in a way I think you have to kind of take this approach, you have to really understand your world whether you've started with a single character or if you have a more complex world, you have to start building that world in a way that makes sense. And I think that's the problem is that often you move from one thing and it doesn't necessarily make sense because the people who've developed the big property around this idea they thought was going to be a huge hit haven't thought it through really carefully. For feature film, there's a kind of template for the deals and, you know, the back end, and it's pretty much boilerplate mm. the way things happen with variations. Um, and that's completely risky, but we have got nothing for this, these new forms of content. So I think it's... Well, I think you're right when you say they're risky, and they are, but I think, you know, their methods of de-risking uh, the, the projects are, you know, pretty well understood by them, they say, you know, we have these stars attached to this project, and we believe we can kind mm. of estimate what their, what their box office appeal would be. We have them in this genre that seems to be a good fit, and we sort of know how to market the genre and whatnot. Yeah. So there's, there's a, there's a f well, for lack of a better word, a formulaic approach of sorts. Even though it's yeah. every project's a risk, they kind of have some idea of what the floor might be. Yeah. Um, and that helps them. And I guess when you're an independent who's attempting to do something where there's a lot of unknowns, um, it becomes very tricky, and they don't become particularly good mm -hmm. financial partners. And, and I'm intrigued by this process because when I go to Silicon Valley and look at how they assess projects, it's a very different process, mm. but they have a methodology for approaching the unknown, for saying, well, you know, I don't know how successful this thing may be. There are some parameters they can employ and they, and they usually protect themselves in the manner of the, the terms, the deals that mm. they do. But nevertheless, they're investing in, in people. Yeah, and an exactly, idea. exactly. And, and they're saying, okay, we're going to help these people because yeah. uh, we think the idea is strong, but these people yeah. you know, need our assistance yeah. and, and, our, and our financial resources and whatnot. Which is a really interesting point, yeah, that and, it's and all about people, and which I think, in a way, any business venture has to be, but maybe it's the fact that still many independent filmmakers don't see themselves as businesses, mm. uh, and, you know, producers even. And this probably contributes to this cottage industry yeah. uh, moniker that we get, yeah. is that people are not treating it as a, as a business and perhaps also by no fault of their own not really allowed to reinvest in themselves yeah. as a business because the, the way that rights are handled and whatnot they, mm. they cannot kind of uh, uh, you know not not all the revenue is going to them that should be and they mm -hmm. can't you know reinvest in their offices and their infrastructure Absolutely. and the uh, new new talent that they bring in and but I think it's a, and it's interesting for an investor if you do start talking in terms of developing IP in the way that you started talking mm. about because that's a much more attractive proposition than talking about putting everything onto this single format that has to work in a very formulaic way the way it's going to be distribu uh, the way it's going to be distributed basically mm. I mean, it's completely formulaic whereas if you talk about developing idea you know story IP or whatever you call it. Um, there are many different iterations and many ways it, you c it could work. And if I think it's a, that's how I kind of like approaching this idea of new forms of story, um, IP, or whatever you want to call it, transmedia native mm. projects. Um, because I think you start somewhere else. You could start mm. somewhere else and you can have a strategy of where that idea may go, mm. um, but it might, it probably won't. Go in the you know there are so many different ways it could go, but having those different routes is a fantastic thing for mm -hmm. an investor to look at to see that you have you know that you're looking at all ways through this an idea you have many ideas instead of a script, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. which is your kind of template for mm -hmm. the business essentially that's where it starts, and 
if it doesn't work in that format and that kind of distribution path or that business path, you're screwed. And that's mm. what I think is really interesting about rethinking ideas, stories. So you're saying that they should really be looking at this as an opportunity. That there's so many avenues that can be yeah. can be can be hand, can be dealt with. But you but then it, mm. it, it involves a completely different mindset from the producer and the creator um, or whatever that is that team mm. is because they have to think of growing of growing something in a very different way. And that's film producers aren't. Mm. Like that, they don't think in that it's way. An, it's, an, it's the role of an entrepreneur. Yes. They, they, they yeah. say, you know, I've got this business idea, but I'm going to discover as I meet the yeah. market that they're not going to respond to what I'm responding to, and this thing has to be constantly refined. Yeah. The strategy has to be constantly rethought yeah. to make this work. Um, so, and, and that's um, very tough at the moment because there isn't. Um, yes, exactly. I think it's to take it to look at it in an entrepreneurial way, but at the moment entertainment or content is financed in a totally different <laughs> way and we're still stuck in this kind of siloed how approach. yeah I mean you know f I would love to profess that I understand how even feature films are financed but I don't because outside of the studio system it's it's a very it's almost recreating a new uh, business every single time and there's different financial partners and in Europe uh, okay we have soft money and subsidies and other things and grants that are available to us that may not be available in the Americas. Mm. But, but nevertheless, um, you know, pre-sales, those things, they can add up to something significant if you have a, a budget of a few million dollars. But if it's something more than that, you're going to be going to a lot of a wide variety of partners and putting together a, a patchwork quilt that will mm. always have pieces missing at critical moments. And it's, uh, it's, 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 I think it's a really um, kind of a nonsense way of doing business because, you know, these people, you know, the producers and whatnot are spending so much time worrying about finance instead of focusing on the product and trying to get you know, mm. the best product they can for the audience and whatnot that it just seems like a really wasted resource. Well, um, in a way, you have to have different people doing different things in a team, and the problem is that producers tend to do everything. They're single, yeah, yeah. single business owners that do Which everything themselves. Which is insane because I think they don't necessarily have the skills right across what they need to have a nice and but what do you do then because you go to yeah. let's say you let's say you have you're an independent producer and you have a well let's start with traditional media and you have let's say if an independent feature film project just to keep things simple and, and, and understood and you say well you know we need to drum up some some kind of audience support just some pre-marketing before this film comes out and that will be very valuable to us, let's say. And, and let's say we don't even have all the distribution we mm. need. So, so we want to kind of do this on our own a little bit to build up some appetite. Mm. And then the distribution should be easier to come by. So you go to a social media firm, marketing firm or somebody and you talk to them about it. And their first reaction is, well, great, we've well, got to pay us because we don't, you know, we're not going to do this on equity basis. And I think that's kind of unfortunate because if you were in a, in a startup world, with the technology, equity basis is, you know, that's okay. You could go to people and say, I'll give you equity in my business in return for your expertise. And they hope that, you know, they'll have a windfall and that that's not a bad way of approaching certain projects. But I think as an independent film producer, people don't respond to you that way. They, mm. they think that it's very unlikely you get this thing off the ground and yes. they want their money in hand. And, and so it's very hard to tap into those resources. And to tell you the truth, if you did go to an agency, I mean, they generally work in the advertising world and they're paid huge amounts of money by um, clients um, to do things that sometimes, um, you know, community work, community building work that could be done in a different way that you don't necessarily go to an agency. There, are, I mean, if you look at that, um, the, the wonderful example of Iron Sky, um, the film by oh, Team yes, Over yes, and yes, Solar yeah. that we showcased, mm, yes. you know, over many over a few Which years. Which looks fantastic, by the way. I mean, really, yeah. I mean, the production qualities are very impressive. Amazingly impressive, and it's premiering in Berlin <coughs> at the Berlinale oh, okay. um, this February. So very exciting. But that's a perfect example of a film that's engaged its audience from right at the beginning. And they didn't work with an agency. They had uh, it was in-house team that was in, you know that was completely intrinsic to the development of the of the project. And in a way, I think that's what works best is to um, instead of going out to um, an agency that may not even have anything to do, you know, may not market stories or may not market the kind of stories that you are telling. You know, agencies. Generally, you know, you'd either have to have a very big sort of like talent base in the agency to sort of riff on ideas. Um, and also, I'm just worried about the time frame because yeah. my understanding is that took many years yeah. to achieve that. And if you went to an agency and said, okay, you know, 
we, we need your help, but we want to do it in, in, in two years instead of four. <laughs> they might sort of say, that's just too long for us. We can't have that level of commitment and, and that's too what expensive. I was you know. about to say, yeah. you know, there's no way that you could um, be interested in an equity deal, equity deal because actually the time scale is so huge and the amount of hours. But mm -hmm. um, there was someone who was in, who was head of sort of the community development in um, in that team in um, blind spot pictures and he worked with Timo over the years um, he was a community manager and he understood everything about the way the story is being developed he knew the director and the producer really well and they could create you know they could move as the as it moved as the story developed as they built their audience and respond to them as it grew so now you can see the benefit of having built that audience because they have many different um, ways they've um, enabled their community and audience to get involved. And, and uh, the expectation is that they could do this again. Yes. yes. That when this, if this film is you know, redu reasonably successful or at least successful enough with its ingrown audience, they could tap that audience uh, appreciation for another project. Well, to, essentially they have already because mm -hmm. their first film um, was called Star Wreck. And it was right. made, um, it was Timo and other collaborators. Um, over a series, a few years, they made it on the no, it was no budget. It was a, yeah. um, it was probably about 10,000 euros they mm. actually spent, but it was made with a community of two and a half thousand people. Mm. Um, and it was so widely downloaded, they let it out on BitTorrent when it was finished. And I think it was downloaded you know, 10 million times or something. And that was the due to the fact that they built this very strong community around the making of the film um, right throughout. And so they already had that community waiting mm. for the next product. So really interesting. Mm. Well, I mean, also, you, you were the first person to introduce me to Greenwald and what he was doing in documentaries, which I think is fascinating. And I, I would love to talk about because, in particular, the way he co ops fans for, for exhibition, I think, is really interesting. And, you know, uh, just to recap, the idea is that he allows fans to have showings, to give, to hold showings of his films in public or private places to, to charge admission and to remit a certain percentage of that back to him. And, and I think that in a day and age where people have more and more impressive home video, audio visual setups, you know, using their homes as cinemas is an interesting idea. I, I, I imagine it's still a little kind of cottagey, but in future it might be very interesting. And what was in, what was interesting about Greenwald is that he actually um, allowed anyone who bought the DVD to do what they liked with the film. So they didn't even need to. They, there's no need to donate or send money back to him. Okay, so there was no. It wasn't a precondition. Yeah. He, it was actually, he set something up called Brave New Theatres, which still exists on his site, um, where it just enables people to organise their own screenings wherever they like. But another interesting example was actually Franny Armstrong. When she um, finished Age of Stupid, her and her um, business partner set up um, something called, um, I think it was Indie Screenings, um, which I think now BritDoc are um, involved in an aspect of that, which actually has a way to monetize the uh, community um, screening. So basically, it's um, you can rent uh, a DVD, and you actually sort of like when you're filling in the form, you sort of say whether you're a public. Uh, you know, whether you're a private company, whether you're not for profit, whether you're in education, um, number of people who are going to go to that screening, um, whether you're going to charge a fee, and you can make a profit on it, but you send a certain amount back mm -hmm. to the company, to Franny's company, according to what the mm -hmm. site works out and what they feel you should um, pay, mm -hmm. according to who you are and how many people are screening, which I think is an absolutely brilliant idea. And it's based on trust as well. Mm -hmm which I think is another important issue, especially when you're mm -hmm. dealing with sort of social issue films. Um, and you're I think that's, that's the, the, the key point too, is that the, the, the product, the films that are being talked about here are, are social issues, they are political issues, they're things that are easy to catalyze um, you know, people around, and that helps. But I think that what you just described is interesting because it, it provides an opportunity for people that have other types of businesses to bring film into the mix because you know, I was I was having a roundtable discussion with some people recently about this issue, and we're saying, you know, in bookstores they added cafes and did other things to kind of mix use the environment, 
which increase their margins and also foster a sense of community. And the same thing could be done if a business owner wanted to have, uh, you know, exhibitions, cinema, create a little cinema in their mix, and this could be an easy, low-cost way for, the, for them to do that. And, uh, you know, we were kind of keen on the idea of uh, cinemas becoming like uh, community centers almost, and so this would be a kind of a reverse engineering process. You, 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 you choose a location where there already is some kind of community activity and you add cinema mm -hmm. to the mix. Yeah, you're going bottom yeah. up, which is yeah. kind of, especially with these types of films as well, um, who, that are not going to get distributed widely. They may do a kind of event release over a few weeks or tour around different screens. Um, and it just, I mean, I, it fed back revenue to the filmmakers, valuable, valuable revenue. And um, they needed to get the film out um, quickly because they needed uh, it they wanted it to be seen before the last climate change summit in Copenhagen and it was not going to get through distribution in time you know the sales and the release was not going to be till the year after so <laughs> it was a necessity so really does that I mean I know that sometimes when doing television deals the cinema your cinema results are very important to the size of those deals would, would these be taken seriously as cinema release theatrical release in that case or are we still Early I, days. <laughs> I think it's early days still yeah. because they actually had um, a traditional sales agent, say Lloyd, who were involved in the film and they really wanted to work with them but it was just the time scale was too slow mm -hmm. for them and um, I think there was a lot of buzz around the film and they were such an amazing team. I mean their kind of website and their community building was exemplary but it was just the time scale still yeah. of distribution. It just can't happen fast enough. And earlier you were talking about that kind of viral effect. Um, how do you respond to the viral effect? Well, if you have to wait and you have to wait for windows, then you can't respond. And this is the problem, I think, with, um, with traditional business structures when it comes to film is it's often can't respond to the zeitgeist mm. of things, which is mm. an important, you've got to be nimble now. In terms of release windows in traditional film, and whatnot, uh, you know, we can see there's enormous pressure to collapse them. And this pressure is probably coming most foremost from the audience because it doesn't make any sense to the consumer that they see publicity for something and they can't watch it immediately on whatever means they want to. And in a way, I don't think that release windows make much sense for any other kind of product but sort of tentpole feature films that are. You know, I, I can see them benefiting from a kind of staggered release approach and, and they probably can maximize their returns that way. But most films do not fit that category and it does not seem appropriate to treat them in the same manner. So I'm wondering if you were, uh, say, working in the transmedia world and thinking about feature film as a component of your storytelling, you probably don't want any windows at all. It doesn't really make sense to have them. You want to get different elements of the story out in different ways in a way that you think is appropriate. You might want to re-sequence things very differently than distributors and sales agents might might want to. Absolutely, um, and having these kind of like very um, fixed um, sort of gateposts are really really difficult for developing um, story properties and across different platforms. You're always going to be confined by um, the business practice of that industry. It's really, it's really tough. And the vested interests Absolutely. Of, of that industry. But the, yeah, the vast majority of um, movies that are not temple movies, it kind of just so doesn't make sense. It's incredible. Well, I find it an incredibly wasted opportunity too yeah. because, you know, someone will tell me about a film that they may have seen in another territory or something and it wasn't released in, in the, where I am. And I immediately go home and say, oh, I'd like to see that. Maybe not tonight, but tomorrow night or something. And I find I can't. And yeah. then... And then, and then I'm distracted by other things. And I think yeah. the other thing about what you were saying about this, uh, you know, these other alternative forms of exhibition, they probably are becoming more crucial because if you have a film that doesn't meet some of the criteria that we discussed for a larger distributor, those cinemas are sewn up by their product and there's really little opportunity. And I've asked people, you know, with digitization of cinema, does that mean we're actually have more flexible programming? And they said, not really. You know, this is something that's sold as a, as a bold idea, but in mm -hmm. practice, it's going to make it more flexible for them to show the same films they wanted to show before. And so we need other avenues for exhibition than are being offered currently. Absolutely. And when you mentioned, you know, home entertainment systems are just so sophisticated now. Um, I rarely go out um, and see things on a big screen because we have a great screen at home. We have really great sound. 
Um, and so I watch most things at home now. And I just think, think you know, those kind of ideas like Franny set up with indie screenings and, you know, being able to make things available when you want to see them is the only way forward. And I'm sure that the vast majority of companies, apart from the cinema exhibitors, mm. Um, mm. you know, would love to start changing business and be able to make returns faster and be able to sort of capitalise on, buzz mm. on something that's happening at that time instead of well, I don't. I, yeah, I'm, I'm dying to talk to some exhibitors in the future because I don't really understand their point of their thinking on this. And if they... If they are keen to find new ways, I, I'd love to hear it because that's not the impression that's given as a whole from the industry. But also, I, I suspect that you know this discussion of release windows collapsing, you know, usually is heralded as the sky is falling, as a calamity by the exhibitors and whatnot. But I think part of the problem may be because there's been a kind of unitary pricing model for a long time, and and if you don't have release windows anymore, you can look at price optimization schemes of various Absolutely. kinds because. Not everyone wants to pay the same amount for the experience. And, and um, Mark Cuban, um, this company HTNet, um, was a really great example of trying to do that, but really early on. So he, um, as well as owning the uh, digital channels in the States and having um, two production companies, he also um, bought landmark theatres and mm. he was trying to day and date the release of films by Soderbergh. He had a whole um, range of films they made um, with the producer mm. Jason Cleo and Joanna Vicente. And um, people shut down on him, but essentially had a fantastic pricing model where they were really sort of like premium events um, where they'd do dinners around them and special mm. interest screenings and then premium VOD. And now his com the company Magnolia that he bought, film mm -hmm. distributor, they've been really successful with their premium VOD, which has happened before the theatrical release. Mm -hmm. um, and it's ha helped the theatrical as well. I mean, mm. there have been some really interesting figures on their films. All right, so they don't feel that it's been undercut in any way. Not well, at that's, all. that's proof then of this idea, yeah. I suppose, is that, that you know people have different appetites, different price points. Um, and I mean, I heard you know of the story, I don't know how well it performed, but I, I recall that Warner Brothers explored this with Harry Potter, didn't they? At one of the releases, they offered premium VOD day and date for a few hundred dollars or something like that to, mm. to select fans and whatnot. And um, so they had sort of parties and events around, around that activity. And that sounds like, it just makes sense nowadays. It doesn't, doesn't sound like a bold new experiment. It sounds like, well, yeah, of course, you know, some people are gonna wanna see it the moment it's announced and others might wanna wait a little bit. And, but I don't think anyone wants to wait arbitrarily. It's just you know, a question of, you know, you could still have, I guess they still have release windows. It's just a very short, yeah. you know, matter of days or weeks or something. My interest in transmedia is also about the business models that, that people come up with. And, and of course, this is gonna be very interesting to financiers and distributors because everyone wants to know how do you make money in transmedia and one of the places that I hunting grounds that I go to for great business ideas is in the video gaming sector because it seems like every year or every two years someone's got this great new business model and while it may not work in other industries it's it certainly is a provides you with a new approach to consider so I guess in the last couple of years some uh, approaches that have become important to the the video game industry has been the idea of user generated content so you know, building story words with, with audience participation because if you want a high volume of customers, you can't build it all for them. They'll consume it too fast. You need some means, which means giving them a toolkit of some kind that they can, can use. And there's lots of great examples of, of success stories from this. The other one which I think is quite interesting and innovative is the idea of shipping a half, you know, partially finished product, beta testing with a, with a core kind of group, and then going on from there and then resourcing things um, as and when it seems appropriate. And also as part of that approach, it's somewhat of a scattergun portfolio approach. They'll, they'll put out maybe four or five titles and they'll see which ones gain the heat and then invest in those and move those forwards and kill the others. So I think that how this applies to me for transmedia is that you might, you might, you might not want to put all your eggs in one basket. You might say, I've got a number of different story possibilities. We're going to try various exploitations of each. And we're going to, you know, give them all the same kind of resource level and see what happens. And if something starts to, to take off in one area, we'll work on that. And we'll, we'll invest more in that. And in terms of user-generated content, I think this is very appropriate to any kind of transmedia activity because you are asking the audience to be engaged and what better way than to get their feedback or opinion or what it may be in this. So I think that transmedia is applying some of these um, ideas that are, that are developed in gaming and using it for other forms of entertainment. Absolutely. What an important 
part that we kind of missed out of the conversation in a way is the uh, audience um, and that's an essential element that t you know ties together uh, mm. cross media or transmedia property and they have to be brought in as as early as possible and that is an incredibly useful thing to do and it, when you think about film development the audience is not addressed until you literally put it out on exhibition platforms which is insane mm. and this idea of zeitgeist is completely insane because it's years afterwards um you're just praying that someone's going to react to it so now we have the tools to do this this is a really strong way of building something and again i'm going to go back to iron sky um it's a perfect example of how the audience was was involved all the way through and their opinion was asked mm. about many different things even though there's a very strong vision to the film it was you know it was written by um one person it, it was written in collaboration with um, the audience too. It wasn't sort of like deep mm -hmm. participation in terms of getting people, you know, many people to write parts of the script, but um, advice, um, basically the writer director asked the audience to feed back on ideas or to help him with certain ideas, which is the perfect way to bring someone in. And I, to think, I think getting that balance right is really important because, you know, when I talk to writers about putting their work in an unfinished basis online to discuss with the community of fans or whomever they may be, they're, they're terrified. This sounds like a terrible idea to them. <laughs> but it is, it's not asking, it's not like having another committee giving you script notes. It's slightly different. Uh, but there is a way, I think, to, to still sort of have that proprietary mm -hmm. auteurship, but invite people to look over your shoulder and to provide you know, some assistance in some way. And for example, Cory Doctorow, who's always releasing parts of his books before he finishes them, and uh, you know, will release a chapter, and, and he has an unbelievable sort of fan base. Um, so I think you know that kind of idea is great. And it's not necessarily you're getting someone to write something, or you're giving them the whole script. You may be just asking um, ideas about specific well, let me ask, because this is kind of bordering on this sort of issue of crowd crowdsourcing, and you know this this seems like an important technique to many transmedia projects. Um, the blend of social media tools with you know content creation, and you know I could see I see the examples. Of, I mean, Iron Sky is fascinating. I don't know what the breakdown is, the percentage of. I would imagine there's a few percent that are involved heavily in kind of crowdsourcing the actual technical elements and visuals and whatnot, and then a large group of people that are really kind of uh, mm. st standing by watching this process. But is that kind of the norm for these, these sort of complex entertainment activities? I don't know the breakdown for Iron Sky, mm. but I imagine that actually their involvement in making the film is tiny. Mm. They, were, they were significant in the um, funding of the film in a bizarre way, even though it's kind of probably about 10% of the budget. The fact that they were involved or feel like stakeholders within the work, whether it's a creative or a financial aspect, they are stakeholders of that film. So it's their film is an incredibly important thing. And in fact, the fact that they feel it's theirs is more important than the fact they financed it. So crowdfunding can be an incredibly important mechanism, not just for financing, but the level of engagement and um, loyalty that mm. you can um, you can build amongst your fan base. And it's a simple thing to ask and a simple thing to do. And you get, um, yes, if you get that level of engagement from, the, from someone as a result, it's a, you said the simplest things are sometimes better. Maybe crowdfunding is one of the simplest things. You know. I think it scares a lot of financiers because it looks like they're desperate and nobody's happy to invest in the film. And I can totally understand that, but I think there are ways of doing it. Or I think crowdsourcing your audience, getting feedback, bringing them into the process, making them feel, if it's something that they, you know, a subject matter or an area that they feel connected with, it can only help. And so I think some element of crowdsourcing, whether it's money or not, is essential now. I mean, when I, when I talk to traditional uh, distributors or parties about all this activity, I say this is marketing. Because that's what they understand, right? You, you say, you're basically marketing this project and promoting it to people, and these are the, the, the mechanisms by which you're doing it. However, it is giving you a, a deeper psychological benefit than, than traditional marketing might be. So um, I think it's quite important. Absolutely. And again, like everything, everything's siloed out in the process. Marketing is always something that comes at the end, whereas it has to come right up front now. You know, that, you know, that in itself is a, is a topic of discussion, because I think... You know, one of the mis misnomers about marketing is that people assume it's, it's advertising and promotion. And, and traditionally, way, way, way back once upon a time, marketing began with product design. 
and was something that was informed the whole process of development all the way through to production to distribution. And so in a way, it's like we're bringing back an old idea that, that marketing is at the heart of these activities and it's not a dirty thing at all. It's about you know, saying how can we make the product match the consumer's expectations or exceed them and you know, what are we going to do to make this product the best it could possibly be. And that's a marketing activity, or should be. So we should actually embrace this. Uh, Absolutely, it should be part of user design. And in fact, we're talking, we use these words much more about cross-media or transmedia projects, like the idea of users. Um, mm -hmm. You know, audiences, you have this idea of an audience as something very passive, mm -hmm. um, and a user is someone who's actively involved. So you need to get that user involved right from yeah. the beginning. You know, this, this is, when, when I was at GDC San Francisco last year, I found out if, you know, there was a great lineup of people talking about stuff. And I walked away actually thinking, wow, you know, the simplest little, mind flip that they have is ARPU, average return per user. This is like, you know, in social network gaming and whatnot, that is the driving, you know, that's the driver. And I think, you know, in film, we never think average return per user. It's like, you know, how many tickets can we sell in this territory or whatever. And so in transmedia, it seems like the, that's very appropriate to think average return per user. If I get a mm -hmm. fan engaged in this thing, you know, what can I, what's the lifetime benefit I can get from that fan, not just in terms of this particular IP, but other IP that I may have in the f in the future. And of course, advertisers are spending a lot of time and money trying to measure what that value is, um, which is incredibly important. And we're going to have to start finding new ways we measure success. I think this is a real problem. If you look in film, it's all about box office, mm. which is so irrelevant now. When you look at you know what is going to be valuable in the future, it's this idea of engagement, of audience engagement. Well, um, even in, even in film, box office is a is a proxy for other things, but no one really knows the DVD sales, rentals, all this stuff is kind of hidden and murky and, and whatnot. So you get these aggregate data, but um, having metrics that are more profound would be interesting, but also metrics that, that, that measure engagement. And you know, I think this to me is something fascinating that, that I'm personally trying to, to develop is some way of, of measuring audience engagement because currently, you know, what's the most well, Facebook is probably the best known thing and it's likes or whatnot or friends and, and these aren't really these are very poor proxies because it's not it's not hard to like some to just give a like. It doesn't really mean a great deal. So we need some kind of tools to measure uh, something richer and deeper, you know, what what people are truly engaged and what have they done to demonstrate that and how can we co opt them for future activities. Absolutely, and I think it's within the advertising world, a lot of money obviously is spent in this area. It's like, is anyone in the entertainment world going to be able to... Um, Find that, uh, that'd yeah. be valuable. I mean, Google Analytics and these sort of tools are a step in that direction, and I suppose, you know, it'll become more more refined. But there's a, I forget the old adage, but I mean, you remember it, the one about, you know, I, I know I know that only, you know, 1% of the advertising works, I just don't know which 1% it is or whatever. I mean, it's the same problem. We don't... We can look at data and aggregate and get a better idea of what's going on, but it's not it's still not rich enough. Absolutely, it's lies, damn lies, and statistics, um, and that definitely comes into sort of like analysis of um, data online. And I, but I think I've spoken to a few people in sort of customer relationship management within the advertising world and the media agencies. That's where it's becoming where it's interesting. Mm. Um, whether really developing some new tools which obviously are only um, used within the big agencies or are licensed out to huge amounts of money um, I'm sure the studios are going to have invested mm -hmm. in these kind of tools but you know where are we going to find them in, in the independent world that's what is really valuable yeah. is. I mean that it would be a shame if it wasn't accessible uh, to everyone to, to use to make to improve their product I mean this is this offers a nice opportunity to ask about funding because we've touched upon a number of times but you know where where does funding from transmedia come from i i've heard you know uh, i've heard a number of people who kind of become seconded to advertising agencies to to work on projects because the agencies are looking for opportunities there and so they receive some money from the marketing budgets of brands and whatnot who might be promotional partners and that seems to be like with uh, Campfire NYC, they have a, a good relationship with HBO and stuff and what, whatnot because there are you know brands that have marketing budgets and they give them marketing money to, to work on their projects. So that looks like in the short term sort of where the money is coming from. But is is that is there anywhere else or is that a, a long term? Also, I should point out these promotional partners and whatnot are not getting involved that deep and that early. 
So, and that's the issue is that it really has to be built from the bottom up. And and when you look in terms of um, you know really smart agencies like Campfire, they're being brought in at the end again. Mm. Um, so they're not someone who's been involved in necessarily the storytelling process from the beginning, which is really important. So who is developing um, cross-media native projects? Soft funders are starting to set up funds. A lot of them are small amounts of money um, and tend to be based sort of around R&D, which is good. Mm. Um, but there's, it's, it's kind of insignificant still. So we're seeing, you know, in the Nordic countries, um, so that their film institutes um, mm. and regional um, agencies have got funds. Um, in Germany, um, the major the federal states, um, so around Berlin, Brandenburg, the NRW, they have small funds, again, for interactive mm. work. And what, what are the fund sizes? I mean, what are the kind of grant sizes they're giving? Are we talking about five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars type of thing, or I mean, it's more like, significant? And, and I would say probably around the sort of one hundred and fifty thousand euro oh, well, up that's, to. That's very good. So um, that, that's sub- that's substantial, and to a transmedia project that could could go somewhere. Absolutely, and the EU also has a um, interactive um, funding scheme. Again, it's a lot of them tend to be attached to traditional product traditional mm. formats, which can be an issue. And there's a lot of debate around the EU fund, whether mm. it has to be adapted. It used to, you used to be able to fund games, now you can't. It has to be either around um, a TV or a film format, mm-hmm. the property. So it does kind mm. of tend to um, limit certain things that you can do. It's great the money's there, though. The UK, we don't have anything yet. You know, and there I, was, I, in terms of the UK, I did, I did speak to someone in media who said that there is something kind of in development the BFI. I don't quite know what the end result is going to be. But they were also talking about a fund they have where y- you could put a transmedia project with IP at the heart of it in the fund as long as there was a software development component where you were developing software that could be licensed and used in some way. So I think in terms of this discussion of metrics, if you were a company that had an IP that you were building, but you were developing software to measure things that could be a benefit as a product later on. That Absolutely. I think they were probably talking about the Technology Strategy Board. Something um, like that sounds familiar. Maybe that's what it was. Which finances um, techno- you know, R&D development of technology across different industries. And there's a there's a section for creative industry, so they have many calls. And it's generally around, um, exactly like you said, developing software for measuring or the exploitation of content. And that's right across the creative industries. That is, but in, and hopefully the BFI is going to uh, start developing um, ha, different Has types BFI of discussed, have they, have they done any private discussions with people in the industry about what to do? Well, they just released the film policy review, so there were discussions that mm. happened um, mm-hmm. about innovation that were part of the consultancy, so um, for the review, and I guess now they're going to start looking at how um, they might fund, but I don't know anything mm. officially. So, and there's, it will be a little while before it's announced, but I'm sure there will be something to mm. do with innovation. It sounds like there's a little bit of heat and urgency on this because I read the DCMS report and they, they call it this review they had, and it sounds like you know, they've kind of acknowledged that that when they closed the the, the sale and lease back loopholes and whatnot, just kind of devastated the U, the UK film industry, <laughs> and and this kind of tax rebate that's been brought in as a stopgap, but I can say that on the ground what it ends up doing is it makes co-productions really undesirable with UK co-producers because they're not going to get much here and you know it's it's fiddly and uh, you know where things are consumed and all it's very complicated and it's uh, much more attractive opportunities elsewhere. Um, Yeah it's very difficult to co-produce with the UK now, Um, that's very true. Um, and it's interesting now in terms of um, these different types of story forms, there are no kind of agreements between countries, so that's a new thing to happen. Mm. Um, the other people I didn't mention, of course, who are starting to finance um, new story forms are broadcasters. A lot of it is around traditional TV formats. Some of them are starting to take different approaches. For example, in France, France has got an amazing amount of funding. Um, Canada has an amazing mm-hmm. amount of funding. Um, France, um, all the channels have a um, have a department where they're looking at new story forms. So Arte has been very advanced. Uh, France Television has a new um, department. Uh, kind of Plus, the developing transmedia around some of its properties. Um, CNC has a significant fund that's been running for many years that funds multimedia and games. Mm. And we've had we also run a lab where we actually it's the most significant. Uh, development lab for mm. cross-media projects in Europe 
um, that's funded by the EU. Um, many of the projects that come through France have been funded in some way through the CNC fund. So it would be wonderful to have some kind of equivalent. Here. Is that is that is that funding available to people outside of France or not? It's, it you can co-produce. Okay. It so, has to be so there could be a co. And does that require a treaty or not, or just could it be an ad hoc arrangement? Um, then? I think it's probably in terms of it would have it would be like a, a co-production. You would have to have a French producer, and mm -hmm. it would have the money would have to be um, come through the French production mm -hmm. company. In the same way mm -hmm. that happens generally with most territories, mm -hmm. you would have to work with a co-producer. So and also, of course, there's a big um, push on French language. Um, but it, for example, Arte uh, produce international and do English language for their interactive, for their online projects. It's not just mm -hmm. French at all. And also in terms of commissioning across their broadcast and film. Canada is amazing as well, has a significant amount of funding through the Canada Media Fund, um, which has a convergence fund, which is huge, and an a interactive experimental fund, which is pretty significant as well. Um, which finances probably uh, it's up to around um, I'm trying to do the conversion but it's probably about um, six hundred thousand pounds they give awards mm. Um, mm -hmm. so um, seven hundred thousand euro mm. something like that and also they have something called the Bell Fund uh, there's a National Film Board of Canada who are a really interesting organization mm. to catch on on their projects you've done some beautiful projects that have won Webby Awards um, mm. and um, Emmy Award, uh, Digital Emmy Awards. So um, that's through their interactive departments. So interesting work around the so world. There's, so there's soft funding support in different territories. And corporate institutions, is there anyone who's kind of identified themselves saying we'd like to get involved in this stuff? In terms of... Um, in Sundance, Coca-Cola announced something, kind of an interesting project called Godfrey's Flower. So, and they've got significant amounts of money they're putting into kind of mm. creative projects. <coughs> um, so that's going to be interesting how that pan pans out. And that's in a, that's actually linked to Mirada, um, Del Toro's um, company that he set up, which is meant to um, develop transmedia projects out of LA. And I think we we'll see some interesting things coming out of the advertising world. Um, okay, so they so are going to loosen some of their purse strings. Right? One would hope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've seen one of the Power of the Pixel sponsors has been Orange, and I, I've seen that you know they have, their branding has appeared on, on stuff, so it sounds like um, they might be an interesting corporation to approach. Do people come directly to them with projects, or is that...? Orange is a really interesting mm -hmm. structure because, of course, it's, um, it's has, in France, um, it finances film, it finances um, transmedia projects, um, it has digital channels, um, and it's a phone, it's a mobile company, so it's right across the different mm. platforms. Um, and they have um, a department that is developing transmedia projects, so yes. But they tend to be French language, mm. but a very interesting company, and because they're they also have a very interesting R&D part of the company that's developing technology, so it's interesting how that all ties together. Yes, I was wondering, you know, um, if you went to companies that have, uh, you know, platforms and distribution in different ways, whether, you know, like for, for example, I've always, you know, Microsoft, you know, they'd like to get involved sometimes in an innovative uh, uh, projects that could, you know, blossom into something that'd be useful on their Xbox platform or their mobile phones and whatnot. So I'm wondering if they're, or, you know, if, if this in the future, Samsung's and LG's and these people might start to get a little more involved in these things because it could produce content for their devices but you know also provide some kind of halo effect on their brand if, if it's successful um, you know like the BMW commercials did uh, the little short films and whatnot if there's a way to tap into their, I mean, their budgets. These companies tend to do it on a kind of one-off basis yeah. it's usually around a campaign that's launching a product so yes I think they kind of are already and many companies either they have sort of short film schemes or they have sort of game schemes or creative idea schemes so um, absolutely I think it'll be interesting when the actual platforms start commissioning and investing so mm -hmm. YouTube have started commissioning work on a channel basis. Yeah I saw there's a very detailed article in the New Yorker isn't there last a couple like a month ago on this what you know it's it's funny because I've met YouTubers over the years and ask them about this, and they always say to me, "Oh, yeah, we have you know money available or, or or resources for independent producers and whatnot." But it never seems in practice to be the case, you know. And I look, and it's and like many Google things, it's kind of a nightmare to navigate 
their structures and what you know what, how do you do this and who do you talk to and whatever but what have you have you seen on the ground a shift I, I know they're supposedly investing in channels and product has that trickled down into the transmedia world in any tangible I think way? it's very sort of based around their model already of channels um, and it's kind of online and that's it kind of around what works on their platform so not yet I think it would change and it will probably it'll be interesting to see, see what happens with those channel commissions mm. and again there's Google TV as well which is separate from right. YouTube that's going to be commissioning a significant amount of product. but it sounds to me like the kid because it's a company that has in its DNA is a sort of ad driven search driven or ad driven ultimately economy it sounds that it'll be an ad driven uh, you know, uh, investment, and so one wonders if that sort of limits the possibilities. As Absolutely, well. which is a kind of traditional model, really. So, um, yes, one wonders whether it will. Um, and it'd be interesting to see if sort of companies like Netflix, because they've started c to commission work out of LA. So some of these platforms only start spending money on product mm. because it hasn't really happened up to date. What are some of the most innovative transmedia projects that you've seen in recent times? through the power of the pixel or wherever? Um, I kind of like saying probably new story forms because I think when you sort of say, if you're going to ask mm. me um, transmedia projects, someone will probably say, that's not a transmedia project. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I'm going to say forms. new story forms. What's the most interesting new story form that you've come across? You mentioned Lance Weiler before. Mm. His uh, work's kind of like expanding every year and he's actually making um, new work every year. So last year he um, did a project called Pandemic which is part of a much larger property called Him that he presented a few years ago um, in our first pixel pitch um, at, Power, at the Cross Media Forum in London. So that was in Sundance. That was a very interesting project. We had a case study of it um, online on our site, The Pixel Report. And um, he also did a project with the National Film Board of Canada at Sundance. That was, it was all part of the uh, New Frontier programme. Um, so it's kind of interesting Sundance are championing this work. The National Film Board of Canada have done some really beautiful, significant projects. One of my favourites is Kat um, Sizek's project, High Rise, which has organically grown over the last few years. And it's a very interesting project because um, Kat is an in-house director at the National Film Board of Canada working solely on this project. And it's all about urban living really around the world. So it's many different experiences from different countries of people living in high rise high rises in highly urbanized um, areas of the work of the world it's a really beautiful project and this year this year she uh, developed it further with Mozilla and this new product they've just launched called popcorn where actually it's built into the browser it's a new iteration of the project and it's um, around a community in a high-rise development around Toronto and um, you can actually the real-time aspects of web feed into a how you interact with it. So for example, in a really simplistic way, I'll explain it. For example, if it's um, nighttime in Toronto, when you're watching it, the backgrounds would be night. Um, the weather changes according to what the weather is on the ground. So all these kind of new ideas of bringing the real time into storytelling is mm -hmm. kind of really exciting. Um, I love that project, that's great. And other projects the NFB have been involved in, uh, Welcome to Pine Point, um, Water Life, beautiful projects. Um, Arte have made some uh, beautiful, um, very significant interactive web documentaries. Uh, so Gaza Sterot, uh, Prison Valley, which they worked with a company called Upion, who were uh, interactive producer. Interestingly enough, this year at the Cross Media Forum, it was really nice to see some of the larger companies who are starting to work on projects. For example, Ardman, who did this project, Tate movie project, which was incredibly participatory. So it was basically bringing children into developing a film project. Right from the beginning, it was a story was developed with the children. The Some of the assets were developed with the children, and it's a really... I, I, guess I remember seeing that presentation. I was very excited by it, and there was something that I think is important to point out, which was that not only did they provide the framework for people to participate, they gave them the tools. They gave them a sort of virtual studio to work in that had the assets, a lot of the assets available to them and, the, and whatnot. And it seems that in these sort of crowdfunding activities where you're asking people to do a number of different, provide a number of different skills, you've got to give them the toolkit. And so on crowdsource animation projects that I've looked at and whatnot, it's very similar. They'll give people like a stripped down version of Maya or something to work in with the assets at their disposal. So 
I think that with entertainment storytelling, if you're going to crowd uh, source people's creative work, you've got to come up with some kind of tool that can put it in a structure and a framework, and that's difficult. It's and it's easy. got to be simple. It's got it's to be, be really simple. simple. You've got to really think of the user. So the whole participatory experience has got to be really easy and not convoluted. So absolutely. Um, there's a, film, a documentary filmmaker called Brett Gaylor, who is a really, he made this great documentary called uh, Ripper Remix Manifesto about the end of copyright. Um, and he got people to get involved in the making of the film. And he had this um, tool that he built, which really was easy to, um, you know, to edit work. It was a really kind of simple, stripped down version of kind of Final Cut that was online. So tools like that were are great mm -hmm. and essential. So I have one final question. Imagine that you are someone who is outside the transmedia world and you're uh, an independent filmmaker or, or a creative artist of some kind and you have a story that you think could be a great, great IP if it could be developed further. You can't go to the traditional sources because it's unknown and perhaps it's a bit edgy or unusual and it doesn't tick the boxes that they need. So you say, all right, I want to look into transmedia and see if I could find people to work with and ideas to feed off of. Power of the Pixel, great. You go to the forum, you can meet people there, uh, interact. Where where should these people be go? Where should they hang out to meet other like minds I mean, I help think them? Online, you know, a lot of us um, are connected around the world, and so you'll find many different kind of communities on Facebook. Um, you'll see on Power of the Pixel, we link off to many different resources um, that you can start talking to people and that's what people do you know even on Facebook there are many Facebook groups uh, around um, transmedia uh, cross media news story forms um, a lot of the it's funny because in a lot of the film markets and television markets there are now sections um, that are kind of tacked on that are around mm. transmedia or cross media or 360 commissioning so um, people interesting people always congregate in these places as well um, ours is the most kind of dedicated to the category mm. and the most international I guess and we focus on everything because we focus on both independent work documentary fiction and studio work there's kind of a good mix of people right across the industries, whereas others tend to be kind of more siloed around the industry, which can be really useful. Mm. You know, the industry that you're involved in, whether it's television or film, or games, or publishing. Um, but I think online is a really good place to start. Um, and also we have labs, we develop, uh, we have our Pixel Lab that runs from, um, from July to October, um, which is very project focused. Um, it's for Europeans, it's funded through the EU media program, so we can only take mm. um, EU members or connected or media country members. So, um, but we also run bespoke labs in different places and we're really happy to, for people to get involved, at, you know, get in touch with us about their projects or if they want us to run something somewhere mm. else but there are some um, there are some great online resources I mean Lance Weiler has his uh, project the workbook project and also on his own site lanceweiler.com um, there's your resource <laughs> Transmediator mm -hmm. which, which has some fa fantastic articles because I know you travel around to different places and it's a really good way of capturing um, what people have said in different conferences um, and also um, there tend to be really good Twitter feeds and feeds from a lot of these kind of more interactive type conferences. Um, you know, I think also if you're going on Twitter and, and looking for hashtags or things related to transmedia, you can filter through and find some interesting yeah. advocates quite easily and, and, yeah. and join their circles and things, and it, that, that's useful. I, I also discovered, you know, that there's a fair number of transmedia meetup meetups that occur in different cities, and so that's a starting plate point as well. Ted, TEDx has started to do some transmedia related things, but that's grassroots driven by whomever wants to create an activity yeah. in their town. So that's Yeah, there's a, a TEDx transmedia in Rome. Yeah. But at least it brings people together, because I think online is a great starting point, because you can start to haunt different areas and listen to conversations, mm -hmm. but then it's, you know, meeting up is essential, I think, to really develop that relationship, mm. you know, long-term relationship with someone in a collaborative process. Absolutely, and labs are a really great place to do that mm. because I, and we find in our lab, you know, amazing work happens and great collaborations because it's this meeting of people from, ver from very different backgrounds, from technology, from uh, creative backgrounds who have a very different language. So it's a real matter of sort of like trying to understand each other and develop a, a common language um, and it takes a time. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, David. Great.